my name is Jessica, and I'm here this evening with my partner, my nature nerd in crime, <laughs> Rebecca. Hi, everyone. So I'll let Rebecca kind of uh, elaborate on spending time in nature and its benefits. Um, well, there's benefits for kids and, and adults, which is about the same. And it involves... Um, improves your short-term memory, reduces stress, improves the absorption of vitamin D, um, sleep improves overall, it can strengthen your immune system, increase happiness, improves vision, inspires creativity, and it relaxes your body and your mind. Nature makes kids happier and healthier and smarter is what a lot of the study, the conclusions to a lot of studies, and I would go so far as say it does the same for adults, it doesn't stop when you're a kid. Um, but the key to it is really like going out more than once, making it a regular habit um, to really feel these benefits and have them grow. Yeah. And so we've probably all either heard of um, the benefits that spending time in nature has on us, um, but perhaps a little less well known is the benefits that it can have on nature and the environment as a whole. So I'll elaborate on that. Uh, there are a lot of studies that uh, look into the backgrounds of folks who later in life have a very conservation oriented career or values that are very conservation uh, centered. And a lot of the studies reveal that um, significant ex and memorable experiences throughout their childhood actually played a really huge role in the development of those um, values and interests later in life. And um, Oftentimes when we think about teaching about the environment or introducing the environment into conversation with children, we'll think about um, informing them of the, the quote unquote state of things of, you know, climate change, I feel like is a word that's used very often in conversation with young folks. Um, there are some people who believe that saving that for later is the way to go. David Sobel is um, an author and a very um, key figure in the world of environmental education who uh, argues that instigating the love, the connection, the appreciation, and just knowing one's natural environment is the first step before introducing them to all of its problems and all of the things that need to be fixed. So that I'd say really um, resonates with nature nerding. We focus a lot on the connection piece and it's well summed up in we protect what we love and we love what we know. So we really start with the knowing, knowing what's around you, that awareness and slowly but surely uh, through recurring experiences, developing a love, developing an appreciation that will hopefully later materialize into some sort of um, concern for the environment. And just to add to that piece, the influence of those experiences as children can be amplified and the impact can be even greater when they are in the present, uh, presence of an adult role model. So this isn't meant as, okay, everybody, the pressure's on. It's more meant as a statement to empower parents um, and any family members, really. It could be an uncle, a grandparent. Um, it could be a really close family friend. Um, that our actions and our presence in these experiences really does um, not only impact in, in the moment, but much later in life. And as Rebecca mentioned, repeated experiences only compound that impact. So just food for thought for you. <laughs> One of the questions that, we, that came to mind when we were writing about this is just like, what is nature and where do we find it? Often we think, uh, oh, maybe I have to go to a big nature park two hours away. Or I really have to be in the wilderness. But nature is all around, even if you are in the city. If you don't feel well enough to go outside that day, just looking at, up at the sky through a window can bring you closer to nature and you can start observing. So it doesn't have to right away be this like really big thing, but these baby steps. So being aware of what's going on. Uh, we talked a lot about the weather already. Um, so looking at your window, figuring out what it's like, um, then you can go to your backyard and then around the block, municipal parks and paths are a good place too to find nature, public beaches. Um, and some of the things you want to look for too while you're out as you get more and more used to looking and scanning 
anything that's a little bit wild, even in the city, our nests and trees, flowers and plants growing in cracks on the sidewalks, look at bird feeders, and you can also listen for different sounds, uh, scratching on trees or looking for marks on tree, tree barks, um, bird song, that sort of those things. I was going to add to that I feel like um, urban wildlife often gets discounted because they kind of adopt this like name of being pests or in nuisances, mm -hmm. um, but that they are just as much wildlife. So pigeons, um, squirrels. <laughs> squirrels, like I, I see a squirrel out here in the country. I see a squirrel in the middle of Montreal. I marvel at their size in Montreal. I think they're really impressive. Um, just gaining appreciation and, and shifting perspective on the things of our every day that we may um, otherwise just not take note of. And one of the first suggestions we have is instead of putting all the responsibility on your shoulders, why not join an outing with a local organization? This will provide you an opportunity for uh, to, to, to test the waters, see how it's received by your kids, different age ranges, possibly depending on the nature of the activity. Um, and it'll also provide inspiration and more than likely motivation. So you'll see what works, what doesn't work, some ideas that you could probably adopt on your own. Um, and we just have listed here, and I think we'll be, we'll be able to share the PowerPoint, Danielle, or slides of the PowerPoint. So these are just some hyperlinks to some organizations that are of interest, perhaps in the uh, Montreal region. GAIP is a group uni d'éducateurs et professionnels en environnement. Les, les Amis de la Montagne is probably something many have heard of, and of course the Botanical Gardens. Um, there are many, many others, but we just listed the first three that came to mind. Um, Another option as a start, as dipping the toe in, would be to join another family that does outdoor activities more often. So depends on what your entourage is like, but um, maybe you can think of a family or two that's always posting really fun looking cool pictures on Facebook and Instagram and you think, oh, I'd really like to do that. Well, if you know them well enough, why not ask, hey, can we do a joint family outing? I'd really like to get my kids out more and I think that it would be a really great opportunity to start that ball rolling. Um, and the last thing to consider, again, if this is all relatively new, but probably also if this is the type of thing that you have done and you just like to get into the groove of more, is taking advantages, uh, excuse me, advantage of the multiple resources that are available. There are so, 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 so many. Um, if having a lengthier list is of interest to you, you're more than welcome to contact us by email and we can hook you up with a couple of extras. But this one right here, for instance, the Children in Nature Network has an entire section devoted to families. And one of the resources they have that looks pretty fantastic is a um, PDF step-by-step -step build your nature outing with your family. So that could be a really interesting starting place. Um, so before you head out, you can uh, get your kids interested about um, your outing in different ways. You can uh, do a little research, uh, learn about the place together where you're choosing to go, and uh, check out the forecast before you go. Uh, for the winter interest area, there's a really good um, little uh, video clip by the Kratz brothers that talks about the subnivian zone, which is the area between the soil and the snow. So it's under the snow and it's a fun word to say and you really get to imagine um, what's living there and all winter, it's kind of like insulated and uh, a warm place for a lot of mice and voles and they're running up and down and you can find their tracks and you just around like the trees, you'll see that um, especially at this time in March, that the space around the tree they're called, are, is like getting bigger and bigger and the snow is melting. And it's under that area that you're going to see little creatures that pop up and go under. Video today, Rebecca, sorry to, <laughs> to interrupt, but as you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's really exciting to imagine that there's life under the snow. And that area is called the Subnivian Zone. I really like talking about it with children and, and teens too. Yeah. So um, you can learn about your place together, where you're going. With teens, you want to really make sure that they're involved in the process of, of choosing. And if you're just going around your block, uh, then you don't have to do that much research, but uh, you could also visit it on your own before bringing your kids wherever your spot is that you want to go. 
If it happens to be the local park, I would stay away from the play structures and find another area in the park um, that your family doesn't regularly visit, where it be like a special tree or a little wooded area or an area with a pond. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things build can help with building the anticipation for the actual event, right? And I think that maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, like as adults, we often try to take care of all the back end stuff on our own, but that's something that could spark interest with um, the kids is like maybe making them a part of that researching process whenever it's appropriate. But I don't know, Rebecca, if you wanted to um, mention anything about that, if you've done that with the kids or not, or. Well, with my kids, there's so many options available. So I normally narrow it down to three choices. Um, and they're a bit, and we've been doing that since they were about uh, seven and eight. And so even when they're younger, it might be just two choices. <laughs> so where do you want to go? Because it feels very empowering to them to be able to decide um, what we're doing as a family rather than have it always be the parents that decide you're doing this today. Sometimes it worked when they were toddlers and other times they were just like, oh, do that anymore <laughs> um so getting them part of part of the process and asking them like maybe they've gone on a walk with their school or another organization but you haven't been on it and they're like oh I really enjoyed that well would you like to take me there or show that part of me or what did you like about it so it's really opening the conversation about uh where they want to go or what nature is to them and following their lead and supporting them in it All right, the topic that everyone has been waiting for, <laughs> getting dressed. So a lot of our presentation can be applied pretty much across the seasons, um, four seasons, 16 seasons, however we like to view this weather in Quebec. But um, then there are portions of the conversation or of the presentation that are really going to be specific to winter. So this is one of them. Um, Rebecca, did you want to run us through dressing for the occasion? Sure, <laughs> dressing for, uh, for winter is really uh, dressing in layers and having lots of layers. Um, for little kids who don't like getting dressed, and my kids definitely were, they would cry as soon as they were in their snowsuits when they were little, three and four year olds, which is discouraging for me. But um, I made we'd make a game out of it so that they would practice and help. Um, and that helped. Sometimes it's, it was like playing music or setting a timer. Um, just to get them motivated to put it on. And as a parent at those times too, helping them would, I would lay out all the clothes, like all in order outside the mudroom <laughs> and uh, do it in stages. Um, base layers, um, there's uh, lots, like as the kids get older, sometimes they don't wanna wear all the gear that the weather is saying they should wear. So what I do now is, and for the last few years, is I always bring extras in my bag with me so that if they're wet or they're just wearing magic gloves, but they realize they need actually ski gloves, um, I have them and I don't make a big deal about it. Not like, oh, you should have brought this or why didn't you do that when we were at home? I told you about it. I'm kind of the person who tries to, like when it's in extreme conditions, to have it um, on me so that the experience outside is just pleasurable and they want to do it again. But again, that's a, a building process. And now my kids are much better at it, but there are days where they don't want to wear a hat or bring, bring an extra pair or even wear snow pants. So we're working on that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a process. <laughs> yeah. And did you want to talk, Rebecca, a little bit about, so in the winter, we do have layers or so many bits and pieces to worry about. Um, and I guess with kids growing like weeds sometimes seemingly, um, always having the proper attire at the right size and whatnot can be in and of itself a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to talk a bit about um, sure. where to get stuff and whatnot? Well, a good place, a good go-to place are, is the dollar store actually, which is quite surprising especially for winter gear. They have uh, long underwear there, thermal socks, uh, balaclavas, and uh, even extra mitts too. Um, so that's one of my go-to spots for extra clothes. And I also, uh, they have like these hot shots, which are like hand warmers and feet warmers and oh, winter insoles too. So sometimes depending on how worn out my kids' boots are in the season, I will put an insulated insole in their boot to keep them warm. 
as well. And that comes in all sizes. Um, and for my teenager, she doesn't always want to wear snow pants, but she will wear um, leggings under her pants or uh, leg warmers. Sorry, that's what I was looking for. She's really into like the, the really wide pants. So she'll wear um, different layers that you can't see. So she still has her cool factor mm -hmm. um, going, but she's warm underneath. And she still sometimes just wears running shoes instead of boots, depending on what we're doing. But again, there's the winter insole in it. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, um, so dollar store is a good place. I also look for a lot of um, stuff at the secondhand store because uh, my kids are growing so quickly. Other times I'll ask uh, in our family circle and friends circle, does anyone have anything to swap or can we borrow it for these outings to see if like this is something we want to do and it's worth investing in. The next slide is also about uh, dressing and just mm -hmm. kind of like a summary of things to keep in mind and um, having a cheat sheet on hand is always a good idea. Um, and again, this can help like gamify, I think, the experience of getting dressed. So mm -hmm. while the first few times it might be a matter of really taking your time, knowing how to, the kids knowing how to do it properly so that they're comfortable also, because I've definitely had little guys that I teach that are um, very particular about how their socks are in the boots or how their snow pants fall on their boots. And very little things, which I'm sure every individual has their own thing. So understanding what feels good to them and then learning to be able to do it themselves. Um, playing with a big pile of clothes that, and this doesn't even have to be before an outing. It could be um, a couple of days before an outing just as like a prep thing to get them thinking about it, but have a big pile of clothes with some random stuff in it that has no business being on their person when they're outside in the middle of winter and just go through it and say, well, should I wear this? Should I wear that? And it's surprising how much of a kick they get out of it. Um, of course, age dependent probably would not be as popular amongst the teens. Um, <laughs> doesn't land quite as well. My humor doesn't land quite as well with the teenagers. But um, yeah, making a game of it, I think, and Rebecca, you mentioned a time or two doing like a lightning dress, I think is really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to keep in mind that it'll be a little bit difficult at the beginning, like Rebecca said, but the more often you do it, the easier it'll be. It'll become second nature, hopefully. Um, so the, the resource here, again, when we share our presentation, you'll have access to it. Uh, it's through the Child and, uh, Child and Nature Network, the Thrive Outside uh, faction. Some other extras to consider um, and to have off, on hand, maybe in a little bag near the door in your mudroom is all kinds of nerd gear, we call it, that uh, you can just bring with you no matter the season to enhance the experience, to encourage the inquiry-based uh, learning, the wonder. So binoculars might be something that are that's a little bit less accessible, but you could find maybe at a garage sale or borrow from someone for the day of. Magnifying glass, simple, but really effective in getting a child to um, pay attention and be more present. And I think just by virtue of having a tool or some extra thing to manipulate in their hands, it um, channels their focus and their attention. And if we wanted to just sim simplify it right down, it's also a little bit of a distraction. So if you say, oh, just look with your eyes or, you know, at least this gives it a little element of like, oh, okay, now I have something that I have to do with this thing. Um, so I'll just go over piece by piece. You have the binoculars, the magnifying glass. These are little observation and collection pots that you can get a uh, dollar store, Canadian tire, um, a sketchbook. Now, not in the middle of the winter, probably, but on the, on the milder winter days, it could be really fun to do some kind of writing or sketching outside um, because I feel like as Canadians, as soon as it reaches like zero degrees, we're like, wow, it's summer <laughs> after so many days of minus 30. It's kind of this really nice celebration of being able to do different things outdoors for a change. Um, having pencils. The, sorry, Jess, we can nope. also use the sketchbook after you've done your activity mm -hmm. so that once uh, as a memory or yeah. you have your experience as inspiration for something you're going to do later. Mm -hmm. um, Thermometers, 
if you have them on hand, not super expensive if you wanted to have one. Um, they have these little kind of plastic briefcase type things, I think that are for crafts uh, at the dollar store. And I usually have like rulers in it and I have thermometers and magnifying glasses. You can add kind of whatever in and just have like your nerd kit. It's like your nerd briefcase. Um, and you could also even have your little one or little ones build it with you. And we have some scarves here and whatnot as examples of other things um, for blindfolded activities of encouraging the uses of the other senses. All right, go ahead, Rupika. I like to bring different activities outdoors. So reading is a really big uh, is a really big component for me with the, uh, the younger kids. And uh, just to find a spot, and no matter what season it is, when it's raining or snowing too much, I'll actually make a tent using a tarp, um, a, like a little shelter, and we'll read a book together. But it could also be finding out like what your kids like to do. If they're really fascinated by trucks and diggers and that sort of thing, you can bring that with you and play in the snow with them. Um, and that's at least a step that it's outside, that it's transportable. Um, so you can listen to a song or have your thing that your child likes to do that they're used to doing outdoors. Mm. Just kind of bring it from indoors to outdoors. Yeah, it's kind of like that little gateway that's like, oh, well, maybe they're not keen on going outside, but if you bring their favorite activity outside, <laughs> you can lure them out. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. I'll also look for the books. I don't buy all my books new because I'm bringing them outside. So I scour all the secondhand bookshops and I use a lot actually from the libraries. So I'll go and just flip through what they have or I'll talk to librarians. And even at the secondhand bookstore, some of them know what I'm looking for. So it's often stories with animals from Canada. They're trying to focus on that. Um, with some story running through, sometimes it's like a season based and uh, other times it could be a book on poems or um, just whatever my child is inter uh, interested in. I just saw um, Natalie's comment on I danced outside for the first time this winter. I think that's <laughs> awesome. Bringing, yeah, even activities that we would typically associate with like inside a studio or whatnot. Um, Yoga is a good one for kids too. And mimicking animals that they're seeing with the younger kids can be a lot of fun too. Because when you're outside, the kids get to go a little more wild. You can be a little more loud and they're the less conform to the rules for, for say, which is kind of fun for them. Um, so you can play that up a little bit within boundaries too and look for inspiration. They can stand like a tree. Well, if the wind is coming through the tree, how are you gonna move? What would the tree look like with your hands up and a storm blowing? So you're getting movement in there too. And they're focusing on something else other than themselves, mimicking nature. Yeah. Um, so we have another checkpoint of, so once you've done all the planning and whatnot, and you for all intents and purposes are committed, um, there's still probably these lingering concerns. So what, typically are those concerns or if they're the same as as previous um if you just wanted to try to to share here we'll also um start moving maybe a little bit more quickly through some of these subsequent slides so that we have enough time for questions at the end um but if anybody else wanted to oh getting lost okay so risk uh getting lost depending on where you're going um that's definitely a valid concern um we, Rebecca and I talked about weather as being kind of like the bane of our existence when it comes to nature nerding, because while we like to promote the idea that um, there's no, and I think Danielle, you brought this up when we met at one point, there's no bad weather, just bad clothing. That's all well and good, but there's definitely terrible weather. <laughs> There is definitely weather that is not ideal. Um, and unfortunately, um, the forecast is rarely reliable very much in advance. So um, we'll talk about weather maybe a little bit later. And unless anybody had anything, having to carry my toddler most of the yeah. way, especially with all our winter gear on. Rebecca, did you want to answer that? Yeah, for that one, for when my kids were young, I chose trails that were flat and I had a big like jogger stroller. We also had... Um, a type of wagon with big wheels so that the child would walk part way and the other way they were in there because at a certain point I, I wasn't strong enough to for the hiker backpacks and I tried even the ergos 
and one kid liked it, the other didn't, um, but we just didn't go as far. So we went to the point where they could walk and then it was like, sit down, have a snack, do our story time and then turn around. And that really moving to the rhythm of my ch children slowed me down tons. And sometimes mm -hmm. it was frustrating on my part, but it, I just made the decision that I'm gonna go as far as they can go and as far as I can carry them pretty much. Um, and they did get pretty heavy at a certain point, but then they also got stronger and you could see in different times. And in the spring, they were really, they were really running double the, the, like, uh, the length of where we were going in the winter, mm -hmm. but it is tougher in the winter, but I would just suggest that if it's, if they're not cold at that point, uh, do something, have a snack, read a story, uh, build a little snowman together, something more an element of play. And then uh, look for flat surfaces that are already cleared. A lot of the bike paths uh, in Montreal are like around the water. Um, just try and ask friends like where you can go that's uh, easier to get to. Yeah. And I think what um, there was another comment about having a child who hates walking. And I think that's probably a very common phenomenon. Um, we had kids who were signed up for a nature camp that was like a lot of hiking and some of them didn't even like walking. <laughs> so um, like a 20k a week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that there's um, recognizing that there's a point where pushing is a good thing and then yielding. And I really like what you said, Rebecca, about kind of um, viewing it as an opportunity instead of having the child match your pace to also kind of meet them halfway or adopt their slowness to a degree. That being said, zero walking can be super frustrating, I imagine. Um, so having distractions and activities to do while the walking could definitely be one of those kind of uh, incentivizing factors for kids. Um, but yeah. Uh, getting closer to nature doesn't have to necessarily like mean going on a hike. Like it could just be for a child who doesn't like it, find a beautiful tree like with huge branches or maybe they like to climb it. What, and you talk about the boundaries and can they climb it or not, or just sit under that tree and play with them so that they're closer to this beautiful spot and start like look up under it, lie under it, look at the sky with them. Um, just to, to get them to clue in to their environment or where they are and that it's a changed place from, from being inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we're going to dive into the meat of it, the things to keep in mind, the key ingredients when um, we are actually living the experience. I think, Rebecca, if you're okay with it, what we can do is we'll go through each element with just like a one-liner um, and that by sharing the PowerPoint, the, the, the lengthier description of examples will be included, just so that we do have time for questions at the end. Um, so we kind of, if we were to distill nature nerding into four key ingredients, we decided on simplicity, attitude, awareness, and routine, um, that if we keep those things in mind uh, at all times, that the odds of the outing being a positive experience are more than, are, are higher. So Rebecca, for simplicity? Um, it doesn't have to be flashy. It's just simple. Um, going for a picnic, a winter picnic, an early spring picnic where it's still chilly, or just even having a snack outside uh, is, is a good idea. Just as a start, like start very, very small, especially if kids aren't used to going out or you're not used to doing it together as a family. Yeah. And we said, we often say that we ourselves need to remember to keep it simple because <laughs> it's easy yeah. to get bogged down in all kinds of extravagant plans. Well, also, once you're listening to the children's needs and seeing where their interest brings you, sometimes you've just planned too much or what you've planned is very different. Um, here are just some quick, uh, simple ideas of what you can do uh, in winter. If you look at the tree trunks, it's when you have sticky snow, we just used a, a snowballs to create uh, some, some swirls and another tree. Um, in the center, we have uh, these ice sculptures, kind of. So we used, uh, you use muffin tins and you pick little berries or um, use boughs or grasses that are coming up through 
through the snow cover and you can freeze it and talk about like temperature and how do you freeze water and hang them in trees afterwards. You can also build forts. Lots of kids love fort building. And uh, when you're building forts too, you can also talk about the subnivian zone and it's like going under <laughs> and it keeps you a little warmer. Um, making um, like nature art here, we have the heart and just like uh, little, little flowers in the snow, like poking holes, getting down close to the snow, feeling it, listening to the sound of it um, can really bring about like awareness of what's going on in winter. Um, to comment quickly on attitude, I think that um, we're all aware that what, how we're feeling and how we behave definitely influences um, the young people around us, whether they're our kids or in my case, my students or our mini nerds. Um, and as opposed to uh, making it a point of critique, it's more a point of empowerment. So when we are facing frustrations uh, during an outing, not sweeping the frustration under the rug, but rather naming it and then very intentionally and visibly in front of your kids um, addressing it. So I'm frustrated. I forgot such and such, or I missed out on such and such um, that I had planned for this outing. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop, take a minute, take a breath. And I want you to help find, help me find something beautiful that we can see right here, right now, next to us. And let's focus on that beautiful thing. And, and ask questions about it instead of focusing on something that we have no control of and it's over. So that's just an example. Um, awareness, Rebecca? Yep, so um, being present and uh, focusing on your, your surroundings sometimes takes a little bit of practice. And I have an activity I wanna share with you that I, I often use with kids. It's called the five finger breath work. So you ask children, you can do it for yourself too. It's just to like center yourself and be ready for your activity. So you, you name five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So you go sl slowly and the kids will be counting rather than saying it, counting it on their fingers. And uh, for taste, I normally say when we're out in nature that we're not going to eat anything just because of allergies, unless you're really sure what you're eating. Um, but for winter, I really like them to get to just breathe in through their mouth and feel a cold air rushing onto their tongue. And uh, then we also talk about like blowing it out again and seeing, seeing their own breath. Hmm. Um. And routine, we've talked about it a few times, the importance of repetition and how that kind of instills a certain um, expectation and uh, awareness of how things are gonna operate when an outing is on the horizon for your family. So it's, um, you get used to all of the, you work out all of the kinks outing after outing to eventually just have this really nice ritual that uh, revolves around spending time outdoors as a family. And part of that ritual is actually even the after part. So the after part, we don't want to um, discount it. It's important. So someone commented on already having very full schedules. That's a reality. And it's also something that um, I think each of us can consider, uh, can, can take a minute and reflect on that and, and, and why we always feel like we need to <laughs> fill our schedules and fill our time. Um, when it comes to nature outings, one invitation we have to leave you with is to not squeeze it in um, with two activities, one before it and one immediately after, because it, it makes it a, another thing to check off your to-do list. Uh, whereas if you leave a little bit of leeway, there is time, for example, for the celebration at the end. Um, which really allows everyone to absorb and take in the experience you've just had. So um, I just did a yoga class last night and I just had this thought that it's almost like the Shavasana of your um, nature experience. It's that moment where you get to stop and really assimilate all of the benefits of what you just took time for as a family. So that could be just looking at photos or videos that you guys took. It could be admiring whatever it is you created. Um, if you had a bunch of questions that you didn't know the answers to, go ahead and research them together maybe. Um, and then talk about it or just talk about it. What did you like? What did you dislike? What was hard? Um, what did you learn? 
and what have a nice proud time. Of? What are you proud of? Yeah, what are you proud of? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we really wanted to highlight the importance of that celebration piece. Looking for signs of animal life is really fun with kids. Even if you don't know what kind of animal it is, figure out where it's going, follow it, uh, ask questions. I wonder what kind of animal it could be, wonder where they're going. You can make up stories as you're doing it. There's seasonal um, scavenger hunts of widely available online that you can print out, which is like, okay, find a pine cone, a smell, an evergreen, uh, those sorts of things. Um, catch a snowflake on your tongue. <laughs> Um, you can also learn to scan for different nests and wildlife, um, animal life in trees, have a snack on hand and strive to be a co-adventurer, which I think is really important, is just letting the child lead in, uh, in discovering nature. You can suggest little things, but you don't have to be the teacher and always have the right answers for your child. It's a process you build on together. Uh, with teens, have them help plan out the outing. My teens love night walks. Um, they kind of were too busy during the day doing other stuff. And, but as soon as I say, hey, let's invite some friends and let's go out on a trail at night, then they're like, oh, okay, that sounds fun. Inviting friends is also a big thing um, for them. And uh, this is actually a picture that we did. We did a night hike uh, for New Year's, even though there was curfew, it was really only eight o'clock at night, but total pitch black. And uh, we lit sparklers at, we, when we we're at the halfway part point of our hike. And we went for about two hours. And we also had a snack after the sparklers up there. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, the headlamps uh, you can get at the dollar store actually. So they don't have to be big fancy ones uh, when you're starting out. Um, my teen likes to document her experiences with her photos and in the fall she on her own without mentioning it to us it was only like months later that she was dashing out to take pictures of the sunsets she found herself a sunset club um, so that was the way she was connecting with um, nature and she would just from different points around our backyard and from balconies take pictures of sunsets wherever she was and share it um, on social media. Here too, uh, it's co-adventure. As they're getting older, they can, can lead and bring you to interesting places and places you might not have thought of before. There's also nature journaling, which can be fun. And that a nature journal doesn't have to mean writing. It can also be an audio file of like their experiences, or it can be drawings and cartoon style, which is, makes it really fun. Uh, for some of the older kids, if you're doing a night hike, you can really uh, focus on the different phases of the moon or something they might have an idea that they want to document too. Um, and someone had asked a question about like, what about outings with um, children of different age ranges? And I think that uh, really inviting teens, and I know this might not necessarily be as it might be easier said than done, but inviting them to play a role of facilitator and, and co-adventurer as well. And um, like Rebecca said, the planning, but also in the, you know, um, the leading of the experience just as much. Mm -hmm. um, One uh, type of activity I like with different age groups in a family is my kids like to to climb. So I'll look for a spot that has a lot of climbing. So it doesn't really, it slows us down. We're not actually hiking, but they're going from rock to rock and encouraging each other or they're helping each other get to a, a higher level within a safe range. <laughs> um, and to just close off and reiterate something we've repeated many times, just as no two days are the same, no two outings will be the same. You can implement the exact same plan that worked amazingly the last time and because the weather is different or you're feeling different or somebody didn't quite sleep as well it might go differently and I think that um, being resilient and adaptable and flexible which we're all very capable of I think the last two years taught us that if anything else <laughs> um, to to remember that um, just because this outing didn't necessarily go the way we would have pictured it will um, there will be other other positive experiences 
what we're ultimately most in control of is how much we prepare and our attitude. And the more often we do it, the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd also just add that going to a same place over and over again can also be good and make it easier too. Mm -hmm. So watching, like when you visit a place, it changes every time because our temperature and weather is changing a lot too. So as you build, you can go to a place like the same place for three outings in a row or three weeks in a row, and then maybe build up to, to switching it. So the kids know what they're, what to expect. Mm -hmm. We have Ashley who wrote, I appreciate being reminded about how our family outings do not need to be extravagant. Some of our best memories were actually quite simple and did not require that much time or planning. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Ashley. I really appreciate that. Thanks guys. It's been a pleasure. It really has. Thank you so much for, for being here. 